Okay, it's working. Hey guys, welcome to The Syndicate. I'm your host, Matt Ward, angel investor, startup advisor, pretty much nothing special. I like to get some of the best and brightest on here to pick apart their brains, steal all their strategies and share it with you guys. And today we've got somebody pretty cool. We've got Matthew Lemerle. He actually reached out. He found the podcast. He liked it. But to be honest, Matthew's pretty awesome. So thanks for coming today, Matthew. Thanks a lot, Matt. So I like to avoid the intros. I'm sure you know that because I'm not great at them. But Matthew's got a, a great background in venture and investing and a little bit of teaching as well. So can you tell me how you got here? Oh, it's been a long road. And uh, the angel investing began about 20 years ago. But prior to that, I was a partner of large consulting firms. Began my career with McKinsey, spent time running the West Coast for AT Kearney and then Monitor Group. I was the head of Gap Strategy for a while. So I jumped around a little bit, but about 20 years ago, my wife Alice and I started doing tech investing. And uh, I then went on to be a consultant to Microsoft and Google and Cisco and PayPal, people like that. And it gave me some insights into areas of emerging technology. I then joined Koretsu and Band of Angels, which are two of the largest angel groups. And today I help run Koretsu globally. We're now the, the largest angel network in the world. So why did you get into tech investing? Was it you or was it the wife? <laughs> That's a good question. So my wife was, it was at the time, the uh, CFO and head of strategy for BlackRock, which is, uh, well, Bar Barclays Global Investors, which is now the largest asset management firm in the world. So I, I would say that uh, she was focused on fintech and needed to understand and was very passionate about fintech. For my, my own part, I was more in into electronic commerce and digital content. And a lot of my early investing was in video games and content-based businesses. So we came at it from two different directions, uh, but over time it merged because at this point, you really can't unbundle those three things. Let's have the terribly hard question. Who's got a better portfolio so far? Oh, everything's done uh, together. Yeah, so. Perfect. That, that's cool. So how'd you get associated with Koretsu? And also that's a terribly hard name to pronounce. Where is that from? Yes, it's a Japanese name. The founder, Randy Williams, had made his money uh, working with Japanese companies uh, back in the 1980s and 90s. And so he chose it. It, it means uh, association of people working together to help each other be successful. Um, and I got involved pretty much because I decided after uh, leaving Gap, I spent a couple of years trying to be an individual angel. And it became increasingly clear to me that it's really hard to do that by yourself. And uh, really, there's certain things, deal flow, due diligence, terms negotiation, and supporting the companies afterwards, where you have to have a group of people working together. And uh, so I, I went out, met all of the, the angel groups here in the peninsula in Silicon Valley, Bay Area, um, Band of Angels, Tech Coast Angels, Sand Hill Angels, uh, Koretsu. And I ended up joining two, Koretsu and Band of Angels. I'm happy with the decision thus far? And, well, it's been a long time now, so my actions speak to that. But yes, it's been about a dozen years uh, that I've been part of those two angel groups. I, and uh, I enjoy being uh, investing and co-investing with those angels. But then I also make direct investments. And Alice and I also have several funds that we work with as well. What's the best way for individual angels to leverage an angel network? You can join one, but what's the best way to get the most bang for your buck, so to speak? It depends upon you and your capabilities and strength. So different people come at this from different directions. You know, serial entrepreneurs who've been successful, had their own exits. They're probably looking to the angels uh, to give sort of more detailed capabilities around, for example, legal or IP or maybe technology due diligence. Um, conversely, if you're more of a corporate type, you're a lawyer and accountant yourself, maybe you're looking for some entrepreneurial insight and uh, around how to build a company, build a team. So I think um, different angels come to the table with different strengths and being part of a group of angels allows you to figure out uh, who you should collaborate with to fill the, you, the holes in your armory, so to speak. What is your strength? My strength is probably around uh, strategy, direction setting, go to market, you know, partnerships, alliances. So since I spent all those years, 30 or so years working with the, the world's largest companies and executives in those companies, the Cisco's, the Google's, the HP's, Bank Americas, and so on, 
Uh, I think I have a pretty good insight into how you help a small company go to market and how you help a small company get to its exit. And most of the companies we back, their exit is a sale to a large company. Um, I'm not a technologist in terms of being able to do technology due diligence. And so I rely upon others to really help me in that space. So you've been in this world for a while. What type of mistakes have you made? Um, I think it's, it's, it's funny you should ask that. Uh, for me, at least, I actually agree with Mike Moritz, who we know over at Sequoia quite well. Um, Allison has worked with Mike on some boards and some other things. And um, he answers the question by what keeps him up at night are the ones he passed on. So it's not so much, you know, you make investments and some of the investments don't work out, but that comes with the territory. Uh, what keeps you up at, uh, at night is when you passed on, on an opportunity that turned out to really change the world. And maybe they even did exactly what they said they were going to do, and you didn't believe that they could. So uh, that sort of forces you to think carefully about, you know, why did you not see the opportunity that people were bringing to you and presenting to you? And I've had a number of those. How do you how do you track those? Keep track of misses, hits, etc., and then go back and pattern match because otherwise, with just one point of data, you're never going to get far. Right. Well, so for that particular issue, uh, it gets rubbed in your face because they've become some of the world's most successful companies. And so just to give you a couple of examples, I had passed on Bright Roll. Um, uh, Sakadotti had come and chatted, and uh, his father I knew very well. And uh, I passed on it right at the outset. They ended up selling to uh, Yahoo for five or six hundred million dollars. And um, in that particular case, the team delivered on exactly what they promised. So you, you don't get to hide from those types of uh, misses. Um, I was at the room at Band of Angels when Practice Fusion uh, came and presented. And even though today they've had some ups and downs, fundamentally the team delivered on what they said. So, so those types of things you know and you, you continue to track because they're in the public domain. They're the unicorns or close to unicorns that we're all familiar with. In terms of my own portfolio with Allison, we do track our own details. Uh, you know, we know what we invested. We 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 sort of if, even though we're a family office and it's a private portfolio, we track it as if we were a venture capital firm, and it allows us to try and figure out you know where we where, where we've done well, where we've done less well, and see if there are any patterns. What do you use to track that? Uh, I'm still spreadsheets. You're still so, spreadsheet. It's not even like a gust or anything. Okay. No, for Kretsu we do. So at Kretsu we use. We've tried uh, Gust. We're right now with Proceder, and we use Proceder for all of Kretsu Capital and Kretsu Forum. Uh, some of the international chapters we have. We have about fifty-three chapters around the world. About a third of them are international. Two thirds are in the U.S. Uh, some of the chapters are on Hacker, uh, but most of them are actually on Proceder. And um, so anyhow, different angels have used different platforms, uh, and then individuals tend to use whatever they feel most comfortable with. So does Kretsu have both angel networks and then a fund you're running as well, Kretsu Capital? Thanks for asking that. That's right, Matt. So the network is a membership-based organization, probably about 3,000 angels today, backing about 170 tech companies every year, uh, making us actually the most active uh, early-stage tech investor in America. Um, but separately from that, we have a family of funds. Uh, we have co-investment tech funds, which top off the rounds of the tech companies as they come through our group or indeed other angel groups. So they could get backed by a band of angels or a tech coast and still get top off financing from our co-investment fund. We have a real estate fund, which is a sort of a separate topic. And now we have a blockchain fund of funds. And I help run all of the fund side of Kretzi. How big is Kretzi's fund side? Um, we well, so total under management now is close to 25 million. So we're in that first round where we're establishing track record. Most of our mem uh, investors to date are our own members. So even though we can take external capital today, it's all member capital, and most of the members are uh, qualified clients, but they're not putting millions of dollars into funds. So uh, we we administered the funds historically for the benefit of our members. Uh, but we are beginning to open them up to others as well. Let's play devil's advocate. You're, uh, or not you, but Carezzo specifically is doing 170 deals a year. Why 25 million? I feel like you could raise a significantly larger fund if you wanted to, just based off of the traction, track record, deal flow, et cetera. Yes. Well, so uh, 
we could place a lot more capital. We've done those maths. And in the deals that we currently back, in the same rounds, para pursue with our angels, we think we could probably uh, place about 100 million per year, which is obviously a lot more than the 10 million or so that we're doing from the funds. Uh, in terms of the blockchain funder funds, uh, our current plan is to place about 5 million into, to, into some of the focused blockchain VCs. But of course, we could also place a lot more there. Uh, but when you build a fund company, you do it one step at a time. And we needed to make sure over the last two and three years that we had the right process, the right platform, and that we felt that we were you know, well positioned and capable of managing that money. Uh, three years later, we feel very good about that. So we are willing to open up to external capital and sort of share our deal flow. We have this enormous deal flow. And uh, out of those 170 companies per year, there are at least 20 or 30 that go on to sizable follow-on rounds, sometimes VC or private equity backed. Uh, we don't have the capital to take those rounds or even to be a substantial co-investor in those rounds. So in the past, we've simply passed the companies over to someone else. Uh, so in the last few months, we had a deal where I believe Mayfield put in several million dollars in a follow-on round. We just had the good news that another company, uh, Texas Pacific Group, is going to put in nine or 10 million. Um, but we didn't have the capital to play. So uh, for us, at least, these funds are a way to uh, raise more capital, help the companies succeed, and also protect ourselves by making sure that there is uh, follow-on capital available where it makes sense. And as you grow the business, where do you see blockchain fitting in? What are what areas are you excited about? And do you have kind of sector-based percentage focuses or ways you see the future unfolding? Yeah, so let me first say that for, for the angel movement as a whole, angels tend to seek out uh, promising areas of new technology sort of in the vanguard of investing. So uh, uh, as you go further down the pipe from friends and family, to angel, to VC, to follow on financing and later expansion, the players uh, are, tend to differ along that path. So the early incubators, the Y Combinators, the 500 startups and obviously ourselves, we tend to see trends as they begin to emerge and we get the opportunity to back those companies very early. Uh, the VCs, uh, some of the VCs are fast movers, many of them are not. Many of the VCs are follow on uh, investors, and so a year or two later, you start seeing large amounts of capital flow into new and emerging spaces. So right now, um, we're active in pretty much every area of emerging technology from artificial intelligence and the Internet of Things sensors, uh, the uh, early life sciences in terms of you know the things we're seeing now around personalized medicine, CRISPR, Cas9 and the like. Uh, these things are all beginning to surface as being attractive areas for investing, and blockchain is one of them. Um, I'm very bullish on blockchain myself because I think we're about to have to re redo the internet. Our internet, the, the one that we have today, which we rely upon so heavily, is, is 30 years old, and it was de designed to be a communication platform, not a commerce platform. So there's some very fundamental things that the internet doesn't do very well. You know what those are, security, identity, you know, uh, tracking the sequence of when communications are occurring, date stamping, these types of things. And um, the new internet that we are going to be building out over the next five or 10 years is going to be more powerful, faster, cheaper. But what's for sure is it's also going to need to solve some of those fundamental problems. And the great promise of blockchain is blockchain as a concept and as a technology is has been developed specifically to be more secure, to help help with identity and trust, to date stamp everything and so on. And so I, I actually do believe that un the underlying technology of blockchain is going to be an integral part of the internet of the future. And that means that there's an enormous value creation opportunity. And that's much, that's even before we get to the conversation of crypto assets and cryptocurrencies. I'm just talking here about the fundamental building blocks of the way we, the world, does digital commerce, digital communication, and are building this new connected world. I completely agree. But what happens when you have a move fast and break things mindset and the house that you're breaking is built of money? So everyone's money is suddenly in the house that you're building faster and breaking harder. Yes. So it's a very good question, Matt. And, and there's a spectrum of perspectives on this. 
Um, I would say that uh, Alison and I, given our backgrounds and the fact that we've spent most of our lives with large companies, established players, you might say, uh, and then helping disruptive companies both uh, build businesses in existing industries and also find ways to help existing players do a better job of whatever it is they do, we're much more sanguine to that point. We don't actually see uh, the industrial revolution and large corporations and large banks going away. We see them getting smarter, faster, more ubiquitous, and hopefully more equitable and fairer. We do actually agree with some of those sentiments, which were part of the underlying mindset of the distributed movement. But I don't need to go all the way to a statement of, you know, uh, there will only be distributed companies and all of the large companies of today's world are dinosaurs and will go away. You know, back in the dot-com boom, I was the head of strategy and corp dev, uh, corporate development for um, Gap. And I will tell you that in 98, 99, we were getting a constant flow of companies opening the door and saying, you're a dinosaur, you're going out of business, you need to, your business was with us. And that was pets.com and toys.com and all of these others. And I didn't believe it at the time. And I think we ended up finding that there was a balance. So established players, if they embrace innovation and if they move fast, can certainly have a, a place at the table. And they bring a lot of capabilities and assets that shouldn't be underestimated. Uh, uh, just to give you an example, Matt, in life sciences, um, I think it's fair today that uh, fair to say today that large pharmaceutical companies have had to fundamentally change their stance and what they do. And they've closed down to a large extent. They've shrunk their labs, and they've almost got out of the uh, uh, the primary innovation business. And instead, they've pivoted towards external innovation. They partner with and they buy uh, disruptive new teams of people creating new products uh, and new life sciences breakthroughs. But what the big pharma companies still do really, really well is they take it to market. And that's complicated. In life sciences, it's very complicated to get new drugs to market and to do that in a way that is safe um, and effective and hopefully cost effective too. Um, that's a different conversation about whether big pharma is cost effective. But I know for sure that they have a place at the table. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's a big, so, big table too. Exactly. So um, I don't have a problem with that ambiguity around large companies, disruptive companies, a changing environment, and how's it all going to play out? I think that is the, the substance, that's the grist uh, of innovation. And it's always been that way. And what we do find, conversely, is most established players rest on their laurels too long and wake up with a big nosebleed because they didn't move fast enough, they didn't embrace the future, and they tried to resist it. And uh, I think that's going on a lot right now as well. A nosebleed or a head wound. That's not exactly what I was talking about, though. What I was talking more about is you have distributed networks, you have blockchain-based startups, companies, whatever you want to call them, and they're building products that are fundamentally disruptive, but they're building products that are also fundamentally economically driven. So what happens? Do you see potential challenges? For instance, Ethereum gets hacked, a wallet goes down, Mt. Gox, all of these things happening, and people losing absolute fortunes. Do you think that could create a disincentivization problem for startups trying to compete with incumbents where if Facebook gets hacked, sure, you know that I'm a guy and I like this and I do all of these things and you have all of this information about me, but most people aren't that sensitive about information. But if you try to reach into my wallet and take out my money, I'm going to beat the shit out of you. Uh, does that make sense? How do you deal with that issue there? Okay, so I, I think, uh, so let me first make this point, which I think is that um, disruptive innovation always passes through uh, curves in which the first people who step up and say that they can do what they say they can do uh, include a lot of people who turn out not to be able to, right? So first movers are risk takers, but they often exaggerate what they're able to do and they end up under delivering and i've seen this now over the last 25 years as an investor i've seen time after time where we've got a new and promising area of technology surface and all of a sudden there's a lot of entrepreneurs saying that they're going to launch a business there's a lot of investors backing them 
but a lot of it turns into vaporware and turns out not to be as real as we had hoped. And then what happens is the first people who really do make something substantial happen in that first mover wave, then uh, essentially educate and give vision and direction to the next wave of entrepreneurs that follows them. And it build, everything builds on its other and it becomes more and more real. I'll give you an example of this, uh, which is search. So obviously the early search engines were groups of people sitting in rooms cataloging websites and trying to figure out how to connect people who are looking for a website with you know, their register. Alice and I, just after it went IPO, we uh, invested in Inktomi. And Inktomi was, without question, the world's best search engine company. And they did a great job sort of laying the track. But that track was then built on by Sergey Brin and Larry Page at Google, and Google displaced Inktomi, Inktomi went away. Um, meanwhile, in that same window when Inktomi was surfacing, there were any a number of entrepreneurs who would have told you we're the next big search engine company, and most of them failed dismally, and, and that comes with the space. So in blockchain, I think the same is true right now. We have some amazingly talented entrepreneurs who are moving fast in this first wave. And you could take, for example, Chris Larson and the Ripple team would be an example of a high quality team really building something substantial, which appears to work. But I read through these ICO white papers and the vast majority of the ones that I'm reading, I, I don't even know that there's a real business there. And I also suspect that the teams who are writing those white papers don't actually know how to form a company or, or, or stand up a company and really build a business. And of course, it's not a technological endeavor only. You know, these white papers, these blockchain businesses are going to be technology and process, but they're also going to have to be companies with people and all of that process that goes with that. And, mm -hmm. um, and so... So uh, when I look at the blockchain space right now, I am looking for the high quality teams backed by great investors and even established companies um, who have a big idea and who I really believe can deliver against it. But there's so much noise that I think you should take with a hefty dose of a uh, you know, big pinch of salt, the vast majority of pitches you receive in this space right now. Absolutely. I would I would start out assuming it's a scam unless you're proven otherwise. I don't want to say it's a scam. I mean, clearly there are bad actors and bad practices also uh, uh, get drawn towards capital. You know, capital is a magnet for those types of people. And, and, and that's certainly the case right now. But I think I'm not really talking about scams. I'm just, just talking about well-meaning people who want to get in, are writing a white paper, have an idea but they're not necessarily uh, going to be successful entrepreneurs. And in fact, we know that. We, when we look at uh, the entrepreneurial ecosystem, most people are not good entrepreneurs and they're not good at actually building businesses and deliver on their promises. Uh, this is not just a vision game. It's, it's a lot of hard work to, to launch a new technology business on a global scale. Fair point. I didn't mean so much scam as junk, but that's a, that's a better way of putting it. Yeah, that's so you seem to be a busy guy. You're running, uh, however, in God's name, I pronounce that, Kuritsu Capital. You're working on the angel side. You have Fifth Era, so you're running another fund on the side, and then also teaching at Singularity University. Is all of that correct? Well, there's more than that, Matt. But, uh, I, so how uh, do you balance your time? Right. Well, so um, I think that... I think that one of the great things that the last 15 years, 20 years has brought to the world is the, the opportunity for us as individuals to shift from being uh, workers and, employ and, and employers or employees to being people who manage our own time. And if you want, you can become more of a project person. I, I uh, used to be at McKinsey, as I mentioned, and Tom Peters, I think, said it very well, which is in this time and in the future, we're defined by the projects that we choose to spend our time on. And I believe that. I believe that the world is full of opportunities and the hardest thing is to decide how to spend your time. But what's for sure is I don't want to spend my time doing one thing. I want to, I want to figure out the things that I enjoy. And, and right now, most of that is innovation and, and uh, investing. 
So I do have Kretsu Capital, which is the family of funds, and I put a sizable amount, maybe half of my time there. Fifth year is my family office with my wife, Alison Davis, and we've invested in about 50 or 55 companies out of Fifth Era. We also do a little bit of uh, support work. You can call it advisory work, if you will, to teams and to companies that we really enjoy working with out of Fifth Era. Um, and then I'm on the advisory board now for Bitbull, which is the first cryptocurrency hedge fund, uh, uh, fund of funds. And also Alison uh, chairs the advisory board of Blockchain Capital Partners with uh, Barton Brad Stevens and Spencer Bogart and Brock Pierce and so on. So we've we've found ourselves moving a little bit more down the uh, blockchain technology path. Uh, we are fintech investors and we are e-commerce investors. So I think it's not possible to uh, invest into those spaces in this time frame without worrying a lot about blockchain because I think blockchain is going to transform global fin financial services, payments, and commerce. Hope so. um, the, the singularity thing is really more about my personal education. Uh, I uh, have always worked, or, or for many, you know, for decades, I've worked with really interesting people who were visionaries and thought leaders. And I like trying to hang out with people like that because they teach me. And so I attach my name to singularity and I volunteer to, to run sessions and speak at their events. But I'm really there because I'm trying to learn. And I find that when I'm in a room listening with some world-class speakers up on the front talking about 20 and 30 years into the future, I just, uh, it gives me ideas. So, uh, in fact, Peter Diamandis, who is one of the co-founders with Ray Kurtzwheel of Singularity, just this weekend, he, he wrote and sent out a really interesting email, which was, uh, you know, thoughts from visionaries about how the world will be different in 10, 20, and 30 years. And I was just reading it, and it was really interesting. It just gave me a whole bunch of thoughts, which from an investor point of view, you're always trying to figure out what really matters. You know, which of today's ideas and innovations is most likely to move the needle in your investment time horizon. And for Alice and I, we're long-term investors. Most of the Kretsu members are long-term investors. So, you know, five years is fine. Ten years, we might get a little bit impatient. So we do want to see the return on capital between the five and ten-year time frame. But for me, at least, I'm also willing to back companies that have even a longer time frame if I think it really is uh, a, a really important idea that's going to change the world in a very positive way. So you say family office. Where did the money come from? How did you get into investing from the financial side of things? Yeah, thanks for asking that. So Alice and I are uh, first generation Americans and first generation wealth. So, you know, we grew up in England. Uh, I would say our families were middle class. Uh, you know, professionals, um, and we were fortunate to get very good education. And so uh, I went off to Oxford, uh, Alison went to Cambridge, uh, and McKinsey picked us up, and so uh, we became business analysts there. And, that, and at that point, we were professionals, and as most professionals do, if you're good at it, uh, you know, it, it, it's, most people are not very good at something like strategy consulting, but we were good at it. And so you accumulate a certain amount of wealth, not a lot, but enough to keep you and your family uh, in sort of a you know, positive you know, uh, frame of reference. Um, we came to America and discovered that America was an even more fruitful place to be. And we came here for Stanford Business School. We never went home. So it's now 30 years, primarily here in Silicon Valley, surrounded by the world's largest innovation cluster. And if you really, you know, if you really pay attention and if you find ways to get active, uh, it is possible to uh, accumulate quite a lot of wealth by being an early stage tech investor. And we haven't talked very much about that, Matt, but I would say, and hopefully we will on this call, but uh, um, as you know, early stage technology investing has probably the highest return of any asset class in the world. And so the people that put their energy into it and are very disciplined and do the right things tend to find that the returns can be very high. So anyhow, we're first generation wealth. We are first generation Americans. We live in California. We love it here. We have five kids and uh, we're very pleased that we made America home. One last question. I don't want to make it incredibly awkward, but how do you deal with that with kids? How do I deal with it with kids? Uh, well, I 
think that, let me say it the other way around, um, how would I deal with kids if I wasn't relevant and if I didn't pay attention and understand the future and the world in which they're going to live? You know, I think that as parents, and I think as parents, ultimately, one of the main things that we do in our lives is we prepare our own children for the future. And they are our legacy. They're what we leave behind. And the other side of that equation is, as parents, therefore, we all are both concerned and excited if we can change the world to be a better one for our children. And that's what Alice and I are doing. We are living in today, but we're putting all of our energy into trying to invest and back the entrepreneurs and the technologists and companies that's going to make the world a better place. And if you now then say, well, how do I do that with my kids? It's saying every day I talk to my kids and I feel excited that I can talk about the things we're doing. And I think for them, they've always had a little bit of exposure to innovation and technology, which I think some of them find very exciting. So of my five kids, four of whom are, you know, only one is at home, but one of them works at Oak Tree Capital and is very passionate about impact investing and sustainable investing. Oak Tree is one of the largest hedge funds in the world. Two of them work in management consulting um, for AT Kearney, and they, they try and help companies do a better job at whatever it is the companies are trying to do. The fourth, Felix, is just graduating from Berkeley, but he's very, very focused on sustainable technology, clean energy, and uh, trying to make the world a better, more efficient place uh, from an energy perspective. Um, so I don't know whether that, that's rubbed off us or whether it's just been that we all live in Silicon Valley, but I will say that uh, for me, this, this space that you occupy and that I occupy is also a mission. You know, we, we are here to make money. But mostly we're here to make the world a better place. And I think Gil Pencina said the same thing on his interview with you. And I resonated to what Gil said. I know Gil, and I think he's really an excellent angel. But uh, he, he made much the same points on his interview with you. So how do you deal? You and your wife sound to be a pretty dynamic duo. How do you work together? Do you have different responsibilities? You're kind of working on similar things together and kind of doing separate projects. How do you balance something like that? Yes, um, it's we have always worked together because we started off with at McKinsey together as analysts. Um, Alison has a slightly different portfolio, so she um, her first time uh, responsibility is that she's on the boards of some of the world's largest companies. Uh, she's on the board of Royal Bank of Scotland, where she chairs their Innovation and Technology Committee. She's on the boards of Pfizer and Unisys and UMA. Uh, right now, and she's been on others like Zoom and First Data in the past. So that's, I don't have much to do with that. Then her second time allocation is the fifth era, where I put about half of my time. And then my Koretsu activities are quite separate from Alison, with the exception that she's uh, sort of a key player in our blockchain fund of funds, because she's opened up the access that we need to create that, that fund. So it's the middle piece, fifth era, where we do spend time together. And the, the toughest thing last year was writing two books. Uh, we wrote one book on corporate innovation in the fifth era. And the second, we wrote a book on uh, how to invest. We called it Build Your Fortune in the Fifth Era. And those two books uh, we wrote together. And I would say that was 90% a good experience, but it definitely there were, it was not always uh, easy. Where's uh, the pants? Well, it's not that. It's that... Uh, you know, that uh, each one of us would have words that we really, you know, that were our babies that we'd put down on paper and some of those words needed to be cut. And it tended to be more of my words I expect that were getting cut. And so that was a little painful. But but anyhow, so um, I think that, uh, you know, we share many of the same values and goals that I've already shared with you. And uh, in that sense, it's not difficult to collaborate and work together as a married couple. Um, but most of our time, we're still doing things separately. So let's say I'm an early angel. I want to steal from your journey and replicate something similar, get to a similar level of success. What do you recommend? Right. So thank you for asking that. And that's why we wrote the book, Build Your Fortune in the Fifth Era. Uh, and it outlines a process. But Matt, I know you're smiling and I'll just answer your question. Um, the first thing is you've got to be clear why you're doing this. It's a choice. You don't need to do it. I've already mentioned that uh, angel investing and early stage venture capital are amongst the highest returning 
uh, asset classes in the world, the the VCs over the long time frame have uh, averaged about 30% IRR net. And the angels, according to Harvard and MIT and uh, University of Willamette and so on, seem to do equally well. Uh, the most recent report uh, from Josh Lerner, the professor at Harvard, and uh, and Shaw, uh, the MIT professor, actually said the angels get a better return than the VCs in this early, uh, early stage tech space. The venture capitalist return uh, is really interesting because when you unbundle it, they get by far their highest return when they go early. Um, and then their return falls as they go into mid-stage, then late-stage VC, and eventually pre-IPO expansion capital. And their returns go from something like 30% IRR in the early phase through the mid-teens down to 11 or 12% return, which is about the same as the public markets uh, over the long haul. So that early stage return is very, very high. But if you're a new, and that's presumably one of the reasons why you might be drawn to it if you were a new angel or a new investor. But that's not sufficient. I mean, you, you can't, this is not a world where you can just invest and be passive and hope for a high return. There's a lot of work you have to do. And the work is sourcing great opportunities, doing due diligence, negotiating term sheets, and helping your companies succeed. And I encourage a new angel to really uh, to find out how much work is that, and is it something you really want to sign up for? Um, I think that most angels, if they're active, can get a very high return. But in a minute, we can talk about the returns to passive investors. I think that's probably less attractive. So that's the first point. You know, do you understand the space? Are you clear it's for you? The second question is, what do you bring to the table? So what are your capabilities, your assets, your relationships that you bring to the table? And um, you've got to be clear on how you're going to help the companies and the entrepreneurs succeed. But the other half of that equation is even more important, which is, what are you bad at? And that you asked me that question earlier on of myself. But um, it's very, very important that if you're thinking about being an angel investor, you're very clear on what you're not good at because you're going to have to find other people to, to fill the holes in your, in your armory, as I said before. So if you don't understand legal issues, if you're not good at doing technology due diligence, if you're not good at marketing, if you're not good at the HR and the people side of entrepreneurialism, you need to find some other people to collaborate with that will make you and they together a, a whole story, a whole team. And uh, that's, at the end of the day, I think the value added of angel groups and being a part of one is that you're going to find like-minded people with different skills and capabilities and put together, you can end up being very effective. But I do see most people start out being angels by themselves. They make a bunch of investments. They end up with a portfolio that may not hang together. And then their investment thesis may change over time. And the realization that they're not a complete story sort of kicks in. And at that point, many people then will join an angel group. Or a syndicate, hence the podcast, guys. The syndicate.vc slash join if you're accredited. Yes. But I, comple I completely agree with everything you just said. Yeah. And I'm happy, by the way, to talk about crowdfunding, technology-enabled investing, and passive investing as well. Um, and I know uh, you have your syndicate. You've had a lot of syndicate leads on your calls. And uh, for myself, I do believe technology enabled early stage investing is the future. Why would it not be? You know, we've applied technology to every other area of investing. Why wouldn't we uh, supercharge early stage investing with technology too? But um, I think it is caveat emptor if you rely upon other people to make your investment decisions for you. And at minimum, you have to know and trust them. I mean, you, you should never invest in a syndicate where you don't know and trust the syndicate lead. Bingo. And they yeah. don't have a track record, the network, and all of the prerequisites to success. That's right. And so when I look at syndicate managers, well, when I look at crowdfunding platforms, syndicate leads, and the, you know, let alone ICOs, ICO white papers, and people that bring ICOs to you, into, you know, promoters of ICOs. Um, the vast majority of those people I couldn't invest with because I don't know them, I don't necessarily trust them, and I suspect the bad people, the bad actors, the the junk 
folks that you mentioned earlier on are in the portion of the puzzle that you don't know. So I do know Gil Pencina very well, and I know Lou Kerner, and I'm getting to know you. And when you build those relationships, you get more and more comfortable with looking at a deal you might bring to me and vice versa. But until you have that relationship, I don't believe in whatever you want to call it, money ball or, uh, you know, drive by investing. I, I don't believe in that. I think early stage tech, you need to know the players, your fellow investors. You need to actually at least have crawled through some due diligence together and you need to be eyes wide open because this is also a very high risk, high failure environment in which to invest. Definitely agree. Look at the incentives as well. So typically with ICOs, you're making money either way. With equity crowdfunding platforms, they're making money either way. Syndicates are the one that don't make money. Even VCs are making money either way to some extent. So it's either knowing who the person is and verifying that, or better yet, doing your own due diligence. If you're doing both, then you're typically in a, a better both than most in a good position to succeed. I agree with that. And, and you already said it, but uh, ferreting out the, the vested interests, how does the other person make money? Are they really investing or are they just making money off when you invest? And to the extent to which people are upfront and open about how they're getting their compensation, then that's one thing. But if you ever come across a person that hides their interests and how they get compensated, I would say never invest with that person. And, and I see that more and more. It's like you have to ask the question, do you have any tokens? And will you get more tokens if I invest? And then they may answer the question, but the point is they should have said it right up front. Look, I, I hold tokens. I get a 10% referral fee if you invest, but I still believe in this company, right? But as soon as people hide it and they don't tell you, then you have to question who is this person and, and what sort of person is it? You know, who are they to do business with if they're hiding fundamental uh, motivations and interests from me? I absolutely agree. I want to jump into the lightning round. How's that sound? Please, yes. So first question. I don't think you've answered this one yet. First deal that you did. Our first deal didn't go well. So Alice and I at the time were senior partners of AT Carney, and that was acquired by Electronic Data Systems. And we met a couple of companies that were great ideas too early. One of them was eOriginals, which was going to basically uh, turn contracting processes into a digital format, so mortgage applications, things like this. So everything that we're now talking about vis-a-vis -vis the blockchain and smart contracts, the originals was going to do in 1996 and 1997 off a mainframe technology platform. It was too early. So that was our first Timing. investment. We lost 100% of our investment in that company. Timing is more important than just about anything else. What are you excited about today? Um, well, I think I told you that at the outset, changing the world for a better place, backing the people that are really doing that work. Uh, I believe entrepreneurs are few and very precious uh, for the world at large. And it's sort of an honor to find good uh, entrepreneurs and help them succeed. And it's not just about capital. It's all the other things, actually, the relationships, the networks, the insights, helping bring all of that to the table. Um, so that's that's why I spend almost 100% percent of my time in innovation and entrepreneurialism. I also think it's a good investment space if you know how to navigate it. And then double clicking on that a little bit, I am actually very interested. I already said electronic commerce, digital content, and fintech. And in all three of those, I do think that the blockchain is critical, uh, or at least fixing the internet we have and taking it up to a higher level of functionality is, is absolutely necessary. Uh, and also maintaining things like net neutrality and openness and so on for everyone, I think is very important. And I think blockchain is in the middle of that. So Alison and I have become very active in blockchain uh, over the last four or five years. It's a fascinating space. It's incredibly overhyped now, but it's also underhyped in the long term, in my opinion. Yes. But that was the same in the dot-com boom. We were there. We lived that. So mm -hmm. you know, it, It's uh, how it works. It's how it works. Yeah, it's what we talked about it already. Yeah, I agree. Two biggest wins to date. Two biggest wins, marrying my wife and having five great kids. Okay, let's take it on the business side. Otherwise, I'm going to make you choose a kid, and that's just going to be rough. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, 
probably the first investment that made me convinced that this was a good space was Telltale. Um, the Telltale Games, uh, the Lucas Arts uh, adventure game team were spinning out, and, and Alice and I were the lead investors. I became chairman of the company for the first couple of years, and Dan. Connor, Kevin Bruner, and Troy Melander were a fantastic entrepreneurial team supplemented by Andre Blanade. And they had a big vision, which started off as downloadable, episodic gaming at a time when we were still buying discs in retail stores. And, and the first part of that, which was just making all their games downloadable, was a huge breakthrough, which we take for granted now. But they were right at the forefront of that. The other part, which was episodic gaming, uh, they've also built their niche there, and uh, they're not—they're probably not a unicorn, but I think that they are the world's leader in episodic video games. And it's been sort of to watch them apply that to things like Walking Dead, Game of Thrones, Batman, and so on. Uh, and it's true. so I'd say that was probably the deal that really made me say this is the space to be. Um, I would also say there was one other deal at the same time. Alice and I backed Dispatch Management Systems, which was Linda Jenkinson and Greg Kidd. They IPO'd that company. Um, Alison was on the board. Uh, the company ended up not going quite as far as they had hoped. Linda then formed Le Concierge, which we also backed. But Greg went off with Dorsey to create Twitter, Square, Ooh, and, and yeah, Ripple. Good. And we didn't back those companies. So... It's again a good example of where you're just one you're just one step away from the, the world's most successful companies when you play as an angel, and hopefully one day you hit one of those. So uh, it's one of the reasons we stay in this game. So I give you one question you can ask a founder, then you have to invest. What's the question? It's always why are you doing this? I mean, I what think, do you listen for? Uh, passion, belief. Uh, commitment, uh, you know, big idea. So that's the first question you always ask. And then the last question you ask as they walk out the door is, if this doesn't work out, what else are you going to do? And if they, have the, if they have that answer, that's a problem. So the only right answer to that question is always, this isn't going to fail. I'm not going to let it fail. And I'm going to work to to the end of the day, making this a success. But if they drop back to, well, you know, if, if it fails, I'll probably go to business school, <laughs> you know, or, or a couple of my friends are launching something else, I maybe I'll help them on their venture. That's also a big red flag. You sneaky bugger. What uh, <laughs> podcast blogs, et cetera, do you like to go to, listen to on a daily, weekly basis to stay informed? Yes, thank you. I I'm a bit more of a reader than a listener. Um, so, uh, in my car, I have, I listen to the, you know, I have a Tesla. And, I, and if you said, what, what are my favorites? Um, it's actually the BBC World Service. I like to stay informed. Um, then I do have a small number of podcasts. There's yours. I was for a while listening to explain, uh, explain blockchain, but I've got through his, he doesn't have a lot of content there. So I have a handful. But I would say that uh, when I'm in my car, I'm tending to listen to music and the World Service. And then I read. So I read a lot. And I've got a big, just to the right of me, I've got a big stack of blockchain books and uh, uh, that I've got to work my way through. And, and we have started putting pencil to paper on our own book about the blockchain. Well, I've looked through all these books. And what I haven't yet seen is a book that is just explaining practical applications of blockchain to large companies and established businesses. So most of these books are talking about why the future is going to be different and why all these disruptive companies are surfacing, as well as crypto. Um, I think we need a book that just sort of says, how's Walmart using blockchain or Goldman Sachs or MIST? And that's the book I think we'll probably write in the next few months. It's much easier to speculate than it is to actually get into the functionality, which is probably a problem behind that. Give me a productivity hack, something that you do to be on and just crush it. Yes. So I think the, the ones that the other people, so I, I uh, you know, so I think Gil said he goes for a run. Um, I used to run, I used to be a sort of an athlete, a world-class athlete, rower and rugby player. My knee is not as strong as it used to be. So I do think that sport is a great way to get the day started. I think that trying to calm yourself, get sent, which is about meditation and yoga is also a good 
uh, a good task. And then I, someone taught me many years ago, try and touch everything once if you can, which is to say, if you're inbound messages, emails, and other things, if you can just touch them once, i.e. respond instantaneously, it greatly diminishes your workload than if you look at everything, group everything, and have to come back to everything later. And uh, when I worked at Gap, and even more, Google, I've worked on and off for 10 years as a special advisor or project manager with on Google uh, initiatives. And they are environments which are preferably touch once. So it's like an email comes in, respond now, and do the best job you can. The the 80% answer delivered now is much better for you as an individual than waiting for the 95% answer if it gets into your inbox and it, and it, and it hangs around because it creates so much negative energy for yourself. So I, I like that thought. Touch once whenever you can and try and minimize the number of things you have to come back to in a second time. I like it. In the bottom of your email, you can say, sorry about any spelling errors from my tiny little fingers or whatever people like to do. Yes. Absolutely, that's a, that's a great thing. What's something I should have asked you about but I haven't? Uh, let's, let's think about that. Well, one of the things, Matt, I think I want to interview you one day. Yeah, let's do it. I do want to do that. I think I've listened to you carefully on your podcasts, and I think you've got a lot of points of view, and I think your listeners would one day like to have a Matt uh podcast and if you want me to i'll come back and i'll interview you sometime. i'm game for that game on let's do it i okay. will let's do it another time because i'm dying right now from tiredness but coffee helps everything but i am definitely game for doing that let's pencil it in yeah let's do it okay, okay. oh god pressure it's always <laughs> hard on the, it's always hard on the other side but it's uh it'll work out yeah well thank you so much for the time i really enjoyed it Thanks for coming on. Where's the best place on the interwebs for people to reach out and say hey? Okay, so we live in plain view, so you can find me. So fifthera.com is our, is our family office slash primary site, and you can find our personal contact details there. And then kiretsucapital.com, K-E-I-R-E-T-S-U capital.com is where all of our uh, funds are, including the new blockchain fund. And uh, so I would say go to the websites first because then you'll know whether or not you actually want to contact us, right? Whereas if I just give you my email directly, you'll start emailing me and it may be you haven't done your own due diligence to figure out if we're a good fit for you. I like that. And we'll throw links and all of that good stuff in the show notes because it's almost impossible to spell period too. Let's, let's just face it. It is. Thanks. Correct. Thanks for coming on today, Matthew. Thanks for tuning in, guys. And thank you so much. And I enjoyed it. Yeah. This has been fun, and apparently we're going to have to do round two. Yes. Yeah. Sweet. And cheers, guys.